Good afternoon, everybody. It's David Perlmutter from Quantum Listing, and I'm very excited to have our guest today, George Cruz from Pursuit CRE, with us today. And uh, George is a expert on multifamily and affordable housing, and I'm very excited because I've dabbled in a in multifamily, but I really could use a good education. So thank you, George, for being with us today and sharing your time and expertise with us. And I want to thank all of our uh, visitors, uh, spectators, audience, call it what you will, for joining us as well. Uh, so George, uh, let's get started. Um, all right. So let's, I want to, here's George handsome guy. And uh, let me tell you a little bit about George. Uh, first, George Cruz is the principal of Pursuit CRE, a real estate investment and asset management firm specializing in multifamily housing. He has spent the last 20 plus years focused on the finance and private equity sides of the industry, having personally closed over one billion dollars in transactions over that period. George recently launched Pursuit as an advisory and finance firm, and he's now setting his sights on his long-term goal of impact capital investing in the affordable workforce housing sector, with a focus on the west coast of Florida. His passion for affordable housing initiatives started as an analyst with a low-income housing tax credit fund, and he's continued those efforts as a Sadowski Fund affiliate, a current member of the Manatee Chamber of Commerce's Attainable Housing Task Force, and was recently reappointed to the City of Bradenton's Affordable Housing Advisory Committee. George graduated from the University of Florida with a degree in finance and later received his MBA with honors from Columbia Business School with a dual focus on finance and real estate. He's a recent graduate of Leadership Manatee and now sits on the Leadership Alumni Association Board. He's a current vice president of the Sarasota Bradenton Columbia University Alumni Association, a former advisory board member for the University of Florida's Masters in Real Estate program, and an active volunteer with Junior Achievement in the area. That's a very impressive bio, George. Tell us uh, a little bit how you first got interested in real estate. Sure. Yeah, that's reading that bio makes me sound overqualified for what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> honestly, it was it was on accident. A lot of people tell stories about how their family owned real estate or they they focused on it, but. Uh, I graduated the University of Florida back in the late 90s. So at the time, there really wasn't uh, any big real estate programs available. And so after UF, I applied at Raymond James. Uh, they had a program where you just basically applied to the company as a whole, and they sent out your resume and your interviews to different departments that needed people. And watch out, you got your tax return. Yeah, yeah, that was... Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I had two, two opportunities at Raymond James. One was for a bond research department. Um, and one was for a low income housing tax credit fund for real estate and the bond research department paid more, but seemed tediously boring. So, uh, I fortunately went the route of the, uh, real estate fund and it was all from there. Uh, did that for a few years, um, made great friends, great contacts, learned a lot. And when I looked to go to business school, I focused solely on, uh, on schools that had dedicated real estate concentrations, which is how I ended up in Columbia. And uh, that was about it. After Columbia, I, I worked for a uh, structured finance fund up in New York City for a while. Um, ran a team doing structured finance up in the Northeast and also ran their hypothecation line group basically funding new hard money lenders uh, in their efforts to do real estate, which is how I kind of got into the higher yield debt platform side of things. And after that, I started up a uh, private equity company with, uh, with one sole investors capital, ran that for seven and a half years. 
and uh, just kind of got sick of working for somebody else and sitting in an office, which is uh, why I got my real estate license and ultimately my broker's license, which Pursuit Siri is technically a brokerage by the state of Florida standards. And I have a handful of clients I still work with, but uh, as you said, my core focus now is kind of back onto the finance and investment side, uh, doing high yield finance on all asset classes throughout Florida. And uh, more importantly, uh, to what my long-term goal is, as you stated, is to uh, create an impact capital fund uh, to acquire workforce attainable housing, predominantly in Sarasota, Bradenton, but throughout the West Coast, uh, Tampa, St. Pete, Clearwater, uh, with the intention of keeping it that way, as opposed to what I was doing on the broker side, which was facilitating people buying C-class properties, displacing all the tenants, and increasing the rents, which... Uh, I kind of got sick of doing, which is why I'm starting up this fund. Yeah. Is affordable housing as much a hot button issue in Florida as it is up in New York State? I, <laughs> it's all I hear about down here. I'm actually on a panel in two weeks talking about it um, down here for our Manatee County Tiger Bay Club. It's it, Florida is actually one of the worst states in the entire country. Um, relative to the lack of affordable housing and the per dollar uh, per hour wage you have to make just to afford housing down here. Uh, I think it's all relative because our salaries are obviously lower down here. Uh, I think it's different uh, up in New York. You, know, you guys are, are pushing pretty stringent rent control to try to fix your problem. That's never going to fly down in Florida, uh, nor do I ever hope it does. I, don't necessarily agree with that, but uh, but you know we're working on different programs to try to make things a little bit more affordable. But yeah, it's it's on the forefront of it's on the front page of the paper three times a week, every week for the past three years. Oh. Okay, uh, you know in my in my town there uh, an affordable housing project is being built, and they picked absolutely the worst location imaginable. It's an environmentally contaminated site, which you know, they are cleaning up, uh, but it's situated between railroad tracks and a parkway. So I can't really see it as a very hospitable location for families, but uh, this developer is soldiering on. But it, and, and it's largely because uh, New York State has mandated that different communities, as rightly they, they should, uh, need to provide affordable housing. And uh, uh, unfortunately, there's not a lot of options in, in our town. So, uh, so tell us uh, a little bit, George, if you would, about uh, multifamily and the market. How do you see it? Sure. Uh, well, multifamily, as, as everybody knows, is, is always one of the kind of darling asset classes, regardless of the, the time of cycle. Um, office, retail, industrial, they you know, they come up, they go down, uh, industrial is hot right now. Um, one of the reasons I focus on multifamily is just that's what I ended up focusing on throughout my entire career, so I, I know it really well. Uh, the other reason is just I like the fact that multifamily is uh, – uh, everything from a mom and pop all the way up to an institutional REIT. And so multifamily is necessary in, in every cycle. It's necessary in every market. You can work with anybody from the, the dentist down the road with a couple of dollars in an IRA looking to buy a, a duplex to, uh, you know, the big company out of New York looking to get some higher yield down here. So where I see multifamily is the, uh, an asset class that kind of transcends what typical investors would look for and where the market is today, I think shows that because the cheap cost of capital today has really democratized the ability to invest in multifamily. Uh, what was um, the Blackstones and the gray stars all buying up the larger properties back in the day, you're seeing smaller funds be able to acquire these properties. It opens it up to more buyers, uh, gives more opportunities for sellers. And so I think at the end of the day, it's a dynamic asset class that, uh, you know, unlike some is fairly, but not entirely, but fairly recession resistant. 
so I think there was a lot of demand in it. I think there is a lot of demand in it, and, and I foresee there continuing to be demand in it. Uh, sounds like a good thing. You know, I have never really done much in multifamily. I sold a site that was converted into multifamily, uh, but I would consider multifamily one of the many boats that I have missed in my brokerage career. Uh, so I'm looking forward to learning more. Uh, why do you think a broker ought to consider becoming an expert in multifamily? I'm not even going to say a broker should consider becoming an expert. I just think if, if you focus on retail, and I know there's people on here that focus on retail, then that, that kind of consumes a lot of your time. You're, you're most likely not going to, unless it's a really small market and you have to generalize it, you're not necessarily going to switch over and also do office or also do industrial. You've got your focus. You have your tenants. You have your clients. You have to keep track of sales per square foot and show up at recon. It, it, it's tying up a lot. But what you can always do is also put a little bit of effort in multifamily. I, I almost treat multifamily as something separate than your traditional quote unquote commercial real estate asset classes, because you may be putting a tenant into an office space and the CEO of that company who's moving into town with his company, as he's relocating his company, has capital and needs to make investments. It's amazing how many places you can find somebody who's wanting to buy a multifamily property. It's almost become a standard asset classification for long-term long -term holds on with your stocks and your bonds. So it, I, I think it behooves everybody who understands real estate and is, is on the real estate side to at least have a, a basic overview and understanding of multifamily. I'm not saying you, you get into the weeds and you, you look up properties on, uh, you know, online on a daily basis, but you know, uh, like I said, multifamily is everything from a duplex to a 500 unit class A property. So, you know, it, you're just opening yourself up to the potential for additional cash flow stream just by being uh, engaged with other people involved in real estate that may have the capital and, and desire to put out. Yeah. I, I think even uh, the Venn diagram of retail and multifamily, for those of us that uh, have spent parts of our career specializing in retail, are, they're moving closer together. And first you really saw it with uh, lifestyle centers where there'd be a residential component to them. I mean, obviously in cities, there's been uh, you know taxpayers and then you know, bigger buildings with uh, retail on the bottom and, and residential up top. But now there are these you know, lovely walkable purpose-built uh, centers and and now one of the ways that uh the people are reviving shopping malls is by introducing multifamily elements to them so correct and and, and it's not just big cities uh you you brought up kind of a mixed use there with the the retail on the ground floor that uh, going back a little bit to the affordable housing side is a huge push across the country uh we're seeing it here people are, are proposing making zoning changes and uh, implementing mixed use components to places that otherwise weren't that were traditional commercial corridors with the sole intention of finding other airspace to build more residential for the sake of inc increasing the supply and uh, trying to get the cost down a bit. So, you know, if you're on the retail side, uh, in fact, I know a retail broker here in Bradenton, and he's a friend of mine. And he's been working with a multifamily developer right now. They're coming out of the ground three blocks from where I'm sitting right now. And he has the, the full lease uh, contract for the ground floor retail. And he's been working with them on the multifamily side as well. So he gets the double dip on that. And I think you're going to see uh, going forward a lot more mixed use in suburban and, and tertiary markets than you saw in the past. Interesting. Um, and you, you mentioned that multifamily comes in lots of different flavors. Um, so that really does open it up to a very broad market in terms of the investors. Um, I had a summer intern a couple of summers ago here at Perlmutter Properties, and the young man's dad is a chef at 
at a country club and he invests money in you know, two and three family houses uh, so that he can have some steady uh, income and you know, presumably build a nest egg for his retirement. Are you seeing a lot of that in your market or is it mostly, uh, you know, professionals with air quotes? Well, that, that's the thing. I think that's one of the reasons people stay away from multifamily a little bit. Uh, and it, it's not in the least bit accurate. And in fact, just using as an example, go on to meetup one day and just look up some real estate organization or real estate meetups in your area. You will find a hundred different meetups of investors looking to buy everything from single family homes to duplexes to up to five, maybe up to 10 units. They're everywhere. You, you, you can't walk down the street without bumping into a RIA someplace. But I can't remember the last time I went on to the meetup app and found a bunch of doctors and dentists and professionals meeting up to discuss buying a shopping center or a big office building. Maybe they're buying a small one or a medical office building. You know, maybe they have a skill set that affords that or they're moving themselves in. But you don't see that as much in other asset classes. But to your point, everything from single family residents, which have now become a, a major supply of, of the rental pool, all the way up through fours and fives and tens, make up such a disproportionate amount of the rental market that uh, I, I think people hear about the gray stars. They hear about the, uh, the, the major players, the, the equity residential. They, they make up virtually nothing of the investment pool. <laughs> they're, they're, for me, they're, they're meaningless. I'll never make a phone call to them because I'll never look at deals that they would ever want to look at. And I, I knew the rough idea, but just to give you an idea, because I actually looked it up to get a little better handle on it, 80% of the rental properties in the state of Florida are under 20 units. Hmm. Wow. 80%. I mean, it, it's, and only 9% of all the rental properties in the state of Florida, and not the state of Florida, in the United States are over 50 units. 9%. It, it's, you know, if you want to get involved in multifamily, you can do that, like I said, by talking to your aunts and uncles. You can do that by showing up at a RIA meeting. You can do that by talking to the CEO or, or anybody at a new corporation moving into your, your town that you're currently helping them put a lease together on office space. They may want to buy multifamily, and they don't need to buy a $10 million, $50 million property. A lot of people are looking for the $400,000, $1 million, $5 million property. And uh, it's, it's such a huge part of the market, but nobody wants to give credit for it. Or people want to get scared off by multifamily because they think they have to tour 400 units and deal with 20 different routes. And that's just not the case. Okay. What uh, are some of the things that people should be looking for when they're considering some of these smaller properties? On the broker side or the uh, on, side? On, on the purchase side. Well, I, I just wrote, and if anyone wants to, to look at it, I wrote a 10 part blog on how offering memorandums for multifamily properties are kind of tricking you. So um, that'll give you a lot more detail than I can right here. Yeah. But uh, th th there's a lot to look at. And one of the reasons you got to be careful with them right now, uh, and at least give yourself a basic idea of what's going on, is because it's such a hot market. Uh, there's, there's very little inventory today uh, compared to even last year, and there's a lot of demand. And because of that, there are a lot of questionable performance that come out. Mm -hmm. um, so you really need to understand it. There's not, there's not a million metrics for multifamily. It's fairly straightforward, but just I, I would encourage anybody who's looking at it either for themselves or for a client to really take a look at the numbers. At the end of the day, this is an investment. You, you need to get an inspector in there. Um, there are a few major capital expenses, such as roofs and parking and HVACs and you know, cooling systems, depending on where you are. But you know, you're gonna get an inspector looking at that. But before you even waste your time on it, you really need to dig into these numbers, make sure that they work. And, uh, and you're gonna see some, some pretty aggressive assumptions. I, I wouldn't take any of them at face value today. I'm not saying people are doing anything wrong, but you know, performers will show you whatever a performer wants to show you. And you know, it, it's very easy to manipulate multifamily numbers because you're not signing 10 year leases. 
if you're going out and underwriting a triple net Starbucks, uh, you know what you're getting. There's not a whole lot of room, you know, wiggle room on that. But if you're buying a 20 or 30 unit multifamily property, there are so many different variables that you can you can play with. So just if if you can't learn it yourself in your market, then there are property managers falling over themselves to get to get properties right now. You call a couple of them, one of them will look at those numbers for you for free, and they'll tell you truly what's up because they want to get the contract. Yeah, that's a very good uh, suggestion. And what about uh, as a broker, how did you go about sourcing these multifamily deals? A couple of years ago, it was fairly easy because you just need to know who's who. Again, uh, because it's so fragmented, uh, when you start trying to figure out every duplex and quadplex owner, that, that does become hard. It's just a matter of knowing the market. Um, you, you meet people over time, uh, typically, you can run into people who just keep buying. And so you find one person and they own 10 properties, get in to know them, and eventually they're gonna wanna sell. Um, traditionally in multifamily, unless it's an, an institutional type thing or generational type asset, people are pretty much gonna sell around the five year mark. Um, and I'm not using that as just an arbitrary number. It's, it's pretty close to accurate that people start selling at a five-year mark uh, for two reasons. One, a lot of multifamily debt is five-year debt. Um, the second reason for that is because one of the biggest benefits of multifamily, especially to these individuals buying the smaller properties, is because it's essentially tax-free up front because the depreciation is so tremendous. Uh, it wipes out all of your gains. Uh, that depreciation starts going away if you're operating your property properly. Um, as depreciation goes down, your NOI goes up, you're usually in the plus or minus five, maybe seven years if it's a longer play, uh, at which point in time your NOI starts exceeding your depreciation loss, and then you start having to take taxes off of it. At that point, a lot of people will recapture their equity that is built up in the property, sell it to somebody else, and 1031 it to a new property and start that whole process with the depreciation over again. Uh, are you seeing a lot of 1031 acquisitions in multifamily? I was. Yeah. <laughs> I was seeing a, I was seeing a ton of it. It was you couldn't you couldn't find a buyer that wasn't 1031. Uh, right now we're not seeing as much just because we're not seeing as much inventory. And the reason we're not seeing as much inventory is, is a couple of things. One, I think people got pretty aggressive on their sale prices and. Uh, for a period of time, they were successful with it because of the 1031s. I know one group out of Texas that bought a property here that I underwrote to about an $8 million valuation. They bought it for $9.5 million. Wow. Um, and they knew it too. They were begging me to find them something else before they went hard, um, but they couldn't find anything else. But you have no choice, especially if you've 1031 a few times over. Your, your tax basis is just zero on that, and you'll just get killed. So they had no choice. Now though, because of less inventory, we're finding people are less inclined to sell their property because they're afraid of what they're gonna do with the capital. And the second reason is a lot of people, again, it's a five year, five to seven year cycle. So if you're sitting on five years today in 2019, that means you bought it between 2012 and 2014. Your basis is really low. And you've seen, depending on what market you're in, five to 8% rent growth year over year compounding, your cash on cash return is just astronomical right now on these properties if you held it for five, seven years. To go out and sell this property at a number that makes real sense to an actual buyer and be able to reinvest that capital someplace to match that cash on cash return or even that absolute return is virtually impossible. In fact, I'm surprised at the stuff we do see so. <laughs> it just, it's the dynamics of the market. I, I wish that wasn't the case. Um, that doesn't do me any good, but, uh, but that's just the reality. If you're collecting five to 8% rent growth year over year, expenses only going up maybe 2%, 2.5%, your NOI is just so high. And meanwhile, you pay down that debt. Um, we're actually seeing people come to us, and again, I don't list properties anymore, but I have a lot of friends that do, and they'll basically say, look, it's a 20-unit property. 
I know it's probably worth two and a half to 2.8 million. Uh, put it on the market for 4 million bucks. Let's see if somebody <laughs> bites. And if, I'm serious. And if somebody, if somebody bites, they take the money because they can withstand paying the taxes if right. necessary, or, or they'll have sufficient capital to reinvest and, and make that return back. And if nobody bites, they just refinance, especially right now, because you can refinance for next to nothing. Yeah. Uh, speaking of financing, uh, how do people go about financing these multifamily acquisitions? You well, nice thing about multifamily is you can finance them virtually any place. Um, there's so much capital out there today that it's it, it's almost gotten aggressively absurd relative to capital for multifamily. Um, what you need to be careful of is if you're buying a duplex or you're buying anything four units or less, it's residential. Uh, it's not commercial uh, relative to banks and lenders. Mm -hmm. So somebody looking at those properties need to understand their tax returns, their FICO score, it's all going to be on the line. Uh, I don't care if you're going agency financing or private lending or, or your community bank, they're going to treat four units and less as residential. Uh, when you go five units and up, which is why a lot of people have five units as a minimum that they look at, then you get to the commercial side. Uh, right now, and pretty much forever, uh, the biggest is agency debt, uh, your Fannie and Freddie. It's, if you can get it, it's so cheap and it's not hard to get per se, but it's one of those catch 22s. They won't give you a loan unless you've gotten a loan from them before. So that's why you, you see a lot of partnering. Um, in some cases, some will bring in a key principal solely because they've used Fannie or Freddie in the past and give them a little piece of the equity just to stand next to them on the loan. And, you know, if you're looking at that from a long-term standpoint, you're holding it for five years, seven years, um, you just want to make sure you're, you're taking the right loan. I mean, I do bridge. So when I talk to people, it's people who think they're going to get a big value pop. And there's a lot of money out there. There's a lot of debt funds that raise a lot of dry powder. And you can get reasonably cheap debt on that. You can get sub-7% debt from a debt fund on a, a value add acquisition for two three years in some cases interest only some cases non-recourse you start going agency route i mean right now you can get you know you can get agency debt in the mid threes to low fours depending on how far you want it fixed for yeah. so it's it's pretty cheap and so when people talk about cap rates being low just remember it's all relative <laughs> if you can finance something at three and a half percent i don't care if the cap rate's five uh it's still accretive yeah Still yeah. getting a good spread there. Right. And so back in 2008, when the world fell apart for a while, was multifamily mm -hmm. part of that disaster or, or was it really just everything else? It, everything was part of the disaster. Um, multifamily kind of got hit in two ways from a, recession standpoint and and none of them were overly meaningfully because of the NLI uh, like I said people need a place to live you, you can always shut down your storefront you can always not travel to a to a hotel but people need a place to live so as long as a landlord can be reasonable you can still do all right in a recession um, where multifamily got hit was um, predominantly one we, we lost a lot of supply of multifamily temporarily because uh, I was doing a lot of condo conversion loans at that time, and it was amazing how people would take virtually any apartment complex and, and put in condo docks. So you lost a lot of supply, which hurt tenants at the end of the day. And the reason people lost property, their properties for multifamily wasn't so much because the values dropped as dramatically as other asset classes. It's because money to buy them was virtually free. Um, I remember doing loans on apartment complexes at 90 to 95% leverage. Well, that's only giving you a five to 10% drop. Even a safe asset is gonna lose five to 10% in a recession. And when you get to a point where an asset can drop 20% compared to other asset classes that were dropping 40, you can look at that and say, hey, this is a safe asset. 
But if you lever it to 90, you're losing your property. And banks took back so much property because the leverage was so crazy on these things that they had no choice but to start selling them back off. And when banks were selling them off, there was deferred maintenance. There was the just the, the tainted image of a bank-owned property. And so they sold them off cheap. And that just started a snowball effect. It, it lowered the valuation, not because the the metrics deserve, showed that it deserved to have lower valuations, not because there was a meaningful drop in tenancy. It, it dropped because banks took all the properties back. And the banks took the properties back because the banks gave people more money than they should have taken. Are you at all concerned that multifamily is being overbuilt today in some markets? Um, well, that's... You threw that last three words or whatever in there. Um, I'm sure some markets are. Yeah. <laughs> I don't follow every market, yeah. so I'm not going to make a blanket statement about every market in the entire state of Florida or in the entire United States. Um, in general, I'm not. Not only am I not concerned, but I think we're not building enough. I think we're all, we're still undersupplied, and I think we're going to continue to be undersupplied. Um, if you actually look at it, every year. The United States needs about 350 new apartment units just to keep pace with population. And up through so 2016, 350,000, right? Thousand. Okay. Correct. Right. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. About 350,000 plus or minus apartment units every year just to keep pace. And up until 2016 ish, uh, which wasn't that long ago, we were only building and delivering about 250,000. Back when the, the recession hit, there was less than 100,000 units delivered in 2009. So we were starting way behind the eight ball with way too little supply. And year over year, we never caught up to that supply. We were still being undersupplied relative to deliverable versus what was necessary for years and years. Now, we're at a point where we're delivering about 400,000 units. And the demand is still around 350. So people look at that and say, hey, it's oversupply. It's oversupply on it if you're looking at it strictly on a snapshot of one year. But it's not oversupply relative to the overall population because we've got a, a tremendous amount of backlog to fill before you ever catch up. Like I read a report just a month ago or so that said that by 2030, the United States requires over four and a half million new apartment units just to keep pace with the additional demand from tenants, of new tenants, meaning young kids that are getting older and start moving into properties or uh, families being developed. Four and a half million over about 11 years. That's over 400,000 400, units per year, every year for over the next decade, just to keep pace. And we've only built 400,000 plus and deliver 400,000 plus like twice in the past decade. Now, of that 350,000 unit demand, uh, you know, that needs to be met every year, the new the new demand, how much of that is, do you think, affordable housing versus market rate housing? <laughs> See, there's the catch. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would I would guess virtually all of it should be affordable housing. Yeah. <laughs> um, because here's the problem. You can't build a Class C property ever. It's physically impossible. Uh, you can barely build a Class B property. You may not put a sauna or a dog park in, but for the most part, you can't build a Class B property. It's not affordable. Uh, construction costs are too high. Labor costs too high. Land too high. No one's building a Class B. Uh, class C. We just put – they increased the density just north of downtown Sarasota a few years ago to try to stir up development down there in a – uh, otherwise blighted area and so they tripled the the zoning uh from 25 units acre to 75 uh 1800 units came out of the ground virtually instantly 100 percent of those are market rate properties that are arguably the 1800 most expensive units in sarasota hmm. you you can't build affordable what you can do is retain affordable and what's actually happening right now uh, is people who don't want to pay $1,500 a month for a new studio apartment are going to find the B properties 
even though they could otherwise afford the A's. And the B people get squeezed out and buy the C properties. So what you're actually seeing is almost half of what would otherwise be quote unquote affordable is being taken up right now in the United States by tenants that otherwise do not need affordable housing. It sounds like what you're describing is a recipe for a bona fide housing crisis, affordable housing crisis. It, it 100% is. It, it, there's no other way to, to put it. It's it's physically impossible. There's only so much money, and you know, every state's trying to do something. Every municipality's trying to do something. But um, at the end of the day, again, you, you can't build B's and C's. You can't build a developer who wants someone wants to call you know quote unquote greedy can't build a brand new property and charge seven hundred dollars a month. It's physically impossible. The numbers don't pencil out. So there has to be something that happens. There has to be public-private partnerships. There has to be government assistance. There has to be donated land. And there's so many options there, whether it's community land trusts or it's um, you know federal or state tax credits or, or issuing bonds. There's a lot of things that can be done. And, and honestly, a lot of people are talking about a lot of these. So it's not being ignored by any stretch because it's not just a housing problem. It's a teacher problem. It's a nurse problem. It's a police and fire problem. It's yeah. it's a it's a big problem because nobody wants to drive 45 minutes from the outskirts of town to work their minimum wage job, and so unless you give them a place to live close by, it you know everyone wants to complain and do you know show up in their NIMBY shirt, and telling people, hey, I don't want that apartment complex next to me because it's slightly subsidized. Um, when they show up at a restaurant with a two hour wait because there's no wait staff there, you know, they can just remember what decision they made relative to that apartment complex. Yeah. Uh, and I worked but, for and, and, you, and you see that in class A though, you see that though. It's being reflected in the market. So at some point someone needs to understand it. Like right now the overall market's about 6% vacant, but B's and C's are only about three to 4% vacant across the country. Whereas class A properties right now are about 8% vacant because they're pricing themselves out, but they have no choice. We just sold a property here in Sarasota. Well, not maybe we, I wish we. Uh, somebody <laughs> just sold property here in Sarasota um, for almost $450,000 a unit. I'm shocked when someone tells me they sold a house here for $450,000. They sold an apartment complex for $450,000 per wow. unit. I mean, there's no way that new owner could possibly rent those things for anything less than insane rental rates to make that work. And now they're forced to. They're going to have to do whatever they can with whatever concessions they can. And this is going to be a, you know, I guess the opposite of rising tide. <laughs> when they go down, everyone else starts going down, but it just squeezes everybody out. Interesting. I mean, I live in Chapco, New York, which is an affluent community, and our taxes are very high. Uh, we don't have a big commercial base. Uh, and I'm now an empty nester. I have four kids that we put in the public school system. And, you know, it was a no-brainer to pay the, the real estate taxes rather than pay private school tuition. Um, and then, so my wife and I have the perennial discussion that all empty nesters have is, should we stay or should we go? And when we started looking at apartment rents in our community are the taxes as high as they are they're still less than it would be to pay rent so we're staying mm -hmm. it's uh at least you know for the, the foreseeable future plus we want to have a, a place we have four kids and we want them to be able to have a place to come back to uh so interesting uh so you think it's really going to take government incentives uh, to get enough affordable housing, and even if that's going to work at all? For the most part, it has to. The, the only other way around, not the other way around it, because it's going to be a drop in the bucket, but that, it's kind of like what I'm planning on doing with, with impact capital, and that's just, you know, you have to be able to buy the right property at the right price, know the markets, and, and keep them that way. You know, make them safe and clean and, and keep the rents where they are. I think at the end of the day, people will be surprised that the 
the yields that I'm hoping to achieve from an investment standpoint are virtually the same as everybody else's yields who are going for a much bigger value add. Just got to know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. But and again, that, that's, you know, people do, people who do that, you know, it's going to be 20 units here, 50 units there. It, it's, it's not solving a, a multi-million person uh, shortage. Yeah. And do you think that alternative construction methods are going to be used sort of the um, modular apartments mm -hmm. or uh, it's not quite here yet, but uh, you know, printed apartments, you know, the, the 3D printing. You think uh, those are going to help with this problem? I haven't, I haven't heard about the 3D printing part of it yet, but uh, no, the modular is something being looked at. Uh, I think there will eventually be some flexibility in some of these communities relative to rethinking, pushing back on mobile home parks. Um, that's been a, a, a big sticking point for a lot of communities for a long time, but they do afford affordable housing and you can put a lot of them on a reasonable size lot. So I think people look at that. Uh, what we're seeing around here is there's some developments going on for these teeny houses, tiny houses, uh, yeah. uh -huh. uh, where they're, they're really small houses. Uh, we just passed something down here where people can put uh, ancillary development units uh, in, in the back of their house as long as it's no more than 50% of their current house size with a max, I think, 1,000 square feet. Um, so it's allowing people to kind of capture some rental income while providing a smaller, affordable place for people to live. Um, I just had a meeting with somebody a week and a half ago who was talking about trying to find some land to do stored container housing. Huh, wow. Like shipping containers. Yeah. Yeah. And are you seeing? So, any, yeah. yeah. Are you seeing any co-living in your market as a uh, possible solution? It's being talked about. In fact, I, I know a guy really well who has been pushing to try to. There's a building he wanted to acquire that's basically a vacant building right now. It, it would need to completely be rezoned for residential and so forth. But that's what he's trying to push for: is to come up with a co-living. We don't have it here um, right now, so it'll be a first. But, uh, but I do know there are some markets that, that have come out of the ground with a pretty substantial co-living property. And I think it's, it's a great opportunity. I, you know, I think you're catching a tenant for a short period of time. I, I can't see there being a, a ton of 40 year old people with their families living in co-living, but you know, you're, you're taking a big chunk of early police people and maybe you're taking a big chunk of retiree people that just want some company. Uh, you know, you're serving a need with them. I think co-living is a, a great opportunity. You just need to convince the community of it because, you know, one of the biggest problems with any scenario where you talk about smaller units to make things viable, uh, whether it be the tiny houses or it be co-living, is parking. Uh, it, you know, you can't, it, it's hard to build anything with with parking ratios here in Bradenton, we have a two two spot per unit rule, regardless of the size of the unit. Huh. Wow! You can't build anything. You go and get co work. You are co living spaces where you have four people essentially in uh, four separate units. It, it, you just bleed yourself dry, and you take up so much of your additional land space that you just couldn't make it work. So that's a situation where it's not so much getting. Uh, money from governments is getting governments to take a step back and realize that, uh, you know, there are some zoning issues need change, just like uh, Minnesota just did well, six months ago. They basically threw their zoning book in the garbage and completely removed single family residential as a zoning classification. Basically saying anybody could build up to three units on any lot. Wow. I did not know about that. Yeah. yeah. And you'd think that in today's world of Uber and Lyft and tomorrow's world of uh, autonomously uh, driven, hailed uh, vehicles that automobile ownership is becoming, uh, ought to become less of a factor in the future than it is today. And it will. And I think people are starting to see that. Uh, Sarasota County, just south of me, just passed something um over the spring where they basically said any unit built that's 
750 square feet or less qualifies as half of a unit, uh, which allows them to get half the parking ratio requirements as well as half the impact fees. So that's pretty major. And uh, I'm actually meeting some people a few weeks to try to convince Manatee County to, to implement a similar process because, you know, if you can convince a developer, hey, you're going to build a thousand square foot property and you're going to get 1200 bucks a month per unit on that, but you can build 750 or 500 and you have to pay half the impact fees, half the parking and get $800 per, per month for those smaller units. It's it's in their best interest to build the smaller unit. It, yeah. It'll be more profitable for them. You don't need to force anyone to do anything. It's basically an invisible hand. Just give them the ability to think about what's in their best interest, and if you do it right, they'll they'll do what's necessary. Awesome. So, uh, I appreciate uh, you taking a little detour uh, with me. Um, in uh, are you seeing today in the market that the spread between bid and ask uh, is, you know, you know, narrowing? Is it widening? Are buyers and sellers on the same page? They are as far away as humanly possible. In fact, if anyone's out of Miami in September, I'm moderating a panel called "What's Going On with the Bid Ask Spread in Multifamily Property at the Crediting Conference." <laughs> but because it's so ridiculous know. out here, yeah, which <laughs> is funny because uh, we didn't talk about that beforehand. You just asked the, the exact title of my panel. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's like like I said, people are putting properties up that they know are worth two and a half, and they're trying to list them for four just to see what happens. Uh, somebody looks across the street and sees that property was overpriced and is on the market. So they sit, they call up their broker and say, Hey, if they're getting 200,000 unit, you know, I want to put my property on the market for 200,000 a unit. And I, I don't disagree with, like I said, and I'll just circling back, I don't disagree with where they're getting their valuations because it all comes down to an investment and cash flow. And they're making too much money, but it just doesn't work. Um, there are buyers who can make it work either because they've got just ridiculously cheap cost of capital and very low yield needs. Um, like I just mentioned the $450,000 per unit purchase down in Sarasota, I have to assume their, their yield requirements for their fund are much lower than mine would be, but you just can't, you can't find a meeting of the mind here. I mean, I've seen so many properties come on the market that are otherwise great properties. Six, 12, 18 months ago, maybe not six, but 12 or 18 months ago, they would have had 20 offers. And who knows, maybe they did, but they sit on the market for six months and then come off the market because nobody's paying these prices right now. So, you know, something's got to give. And I don't think it's going to be buyers coming up because I don't see where there's any more growth potential. Uh, you're starting to see rents button out a little bit. I think vacancies are where they're going to be. I think cap rates are as low as they're going to get. I, I can't see it being on the buyer side where they start conceding to pay more. It, it's got to be the sellers finally giving up and, and selling at more reasonable prices, or it's just a fundamental break in the system and everyone who owns properties right now keeps owning it until there's too much deferred maintenance and they don't want to pay it or the interest rates finally start going up, which is probably the biggest catalyst for this fix. If interest rates start going up too much, it takes refi off the table. And as soon as refi comes off the table, then people will be more inclined to sell. But of course, whoever's buying it is gonna to have to pay those higher rates and they're gonna offer them less and then they should have just sold it today. So if interest rates do tick up, is there enough of a spread in uh, the you know operating income and you know, the net operating income to that people are going to be able to refinance at higher rates. Different ways of looking at that. Um, I always tell people yes, and I, I tell people yes uh, for two reasons. One, interest rates don't go up for no reason. Um, it, it's not as simple as interest rates going up in a vacuum. Uh, interest rates go up because the economy is doing well. Um, this talk right now with the Fed of possibly even lowering interest rates temporarily um, because there's a little bit of a slowdown. So if the 
if your fundamental belief is interest rates are going to go up because the economy is getting better, then if the economy gets better, uh, rental rates are going to go up. Uh -huh. That's one of the things with multifamily is it's not as short as hospitality, but it's not as long as office and retail. You're sitting on a 12 month lease. If inflation starts going up, rents go up with it. So yes, interest rates are going to go up. It's not going to be linear. It's not, not straight line. You're staying in the same position relative to debt service coverage and so forth. But on a broad basis, uh, my belief is always if rates go up, NOI goes up. Um, and the nice thing now, which in the short term I think is going to be beneficial to owners, is there's in most markets, not New York and, and some of the coastal markets, but most markets, there's a historically widespread between 10-year treasuries and current cap rates. So I think at least in the near term, well, near term, whenever rates start going back up again, you're not going to see a step-by-step -step increase in cap rates along with those interest rates. In fact, you can see that just by what happened recently. Interest rates went up, cap rates didn't move. If anything, cap rates compressed. Mm -hmm. Because historically speaking, the spread between a 10-year treasury and a cap rate on multifamily is plus or minus 300. Uh, different markets, different asset classes, different quality. It, it's going to vary uh, a little wider than that. But just using that as a round number, well, right now, 10-year treasury is a tick over two, which <laughs> means it's about two one right now, which means cap rates across the board should be plus or minus five to five and a quarter. Yeah, you may see that in, in a coastal market. You may see that down in Miami. You're not seeing that here. I'm not convincing anyone to buy a property at a five cap in this market. Right now in this market, we're still seeing cap rates between six and seven and a half. Mm -hmm. That's implying 100 to 150 basis point widespread historically over, over treasuries, which would theoretically, and it's not, again, exact science, that, that's going to apply interest rates can increase 100 basis points before my cap rate moves. But while those interest rates are increasing, it's increasing because the economy is doing better, which means my NOI is increasing, but my cap rate is still the same, which just increases the value of the property. Huh. So, um, in underwriting deals today, other than unrealistic uh, uh, values, or what are the other issues that you're seeing in your underwriting endeavors? I think the biggest thing you're seeing right now is people looking at what's, uh, what's happened these past few years. It's been an incredible run-up for multifamily properties the last few years. Like I said earlier, you know, most markets were seeing five to eight percent rent growth. Most markets were seeing three to five percent vacancy, especially down in the the BC range. Uh, too many people, I think, are trying to sell properties based on future performance as opposed to current situation. Um, maybe there was some validity to that within reason a couple of years ago when we're still in that big run up. Um, not that I would ever encourage anyone to pay somebody for future value. Um, because you're the one creating that value and you're leaving everything on the table. But today it's not the same. Right now, rent growth is about 2%, two and change for, most, for a lot of markets. Um, this is very broad because we're talking about thousands of markets, but just in general, rent growth is down around two to two and a half. You're basically growing rent at inflation in a lot of markets right now. And vacancy is kind of sitting at a close to historical number, like I said, 6%. So, any growth is just standard growth right now, but people are still looking at the last few years and projecting that out. I'm still seeing packages of people saying, you know, 8% rent growth, still seeing packages on 3% vacancy. <laughs> and it's just, I, I would just really be cautious on that because, you know, they're doing it because they have to get to a number. Nobody runs all their pro forma before they, they tell an owner what they're going to list the price the property for. They tell them what they're going to list the property for first, and then they run their numbers to make it match. Yeah. All right. So let's uh, hypothetically say my rich uncle dies, and he is nice enough to leave me $10 million in his will. Thank you, uncle. Uh, what should I be doing with that if I'm thinking about investing it in multifamily? what should you be doing with it? I would encourage you to buy it. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, 
No, I mean, people say, hey, it's a, and I've said on this call that the prices are high. And over, yeah. and, you know, and like, but at the end of the day, I still believe, one, if you've got that much cash in your pocket, uh, it should be invested. You're, you're never going to make anything as cash. If anything, just based on inflation, you're going to lose value every day on sitting on that. So you're better off investing. And if you're going to invest it, especially if you have some level of uncertainty in today's market, your best bet is to invest in something that is cash flowing. Um, I would do it at a level that's a reasonable leverage point. I, I would highly suggest nobody's going over about 75% leverage. Um, I'm happy when I see people say they're only looking for about 65% leverage because yeah. um, that's going to help you weather a storm. If you can underwrite a multifamily property at a 140 debt service coverage at 65, 70% leverage, you're not losing that property, even if it was back in 2008. Yeah. And you're still going to own it and it's still going to cash flow. You're still going to have tenants. And yeah, you may not get quite as high yield for a few years, but all those people who did that in 2007 and eight and nine and were able to retain their properties are very rich people right now <laughs> because yeah. they were able to hold that through and the values of those properties went up. It's all the people who gave them back to the bank because they didn't want to put some equity in. So what I would tell somebody to do is, I would diversify the money. There's a lot of properties out there. I would stick with five units and up because you get commercial loans. Um, if you don't, if you're not fully immersed in multifamily, um, the management of it, the obtaining loans for it, you, you can partner up with people all day long. I, I get people calling me about joining syndication groups and joining JV groups. That there's a lot of people looking for it. And everyone brings something to the table. Some people find the deal, some people underwrite them, some people manage them, some people bring the capital. You can put money out in multifamily if you want to put money out. Um, but I, I don't, I hear people say, well, I'll wait till the market turns and then I'll put my money out. I'm like, it, when the market turns, everyone's going to put their money out. Yeah. But you're starting from square one, especially if you don't own properties. No bank's going to lend you money in a downturn if you don't have a, a, a track record and a resume for it. Nobody's going to partner up with you because they're not going to need to because the values have gone down. No broker's going to send you a deal because they've already made their connection. If you wait for anyone who says they're waiting for a crash before they start putting money out, is not putting money out. Time to invest in a uh, in a fund or a REIT that is in multifamily if that's your your attitude. I see no fundamental problem with REITs. It's just, like I said, those are the people buying properties at, at four caps. And yeah. they're going to be steady. They're not losing the property. They're diversified enough. Um, you're going to be fine. But if you buy your own property, I see people making, you know, two-time multiples on sales five years later. I see people making... 10 to 12 to 15 percent cash on cash returns on the equity side of it um th there's a lot of upside to multifamily if you know what you're doing and you buy it right and you manage it right and you finance it properly it, it if you buy a REIT you're gonna you're gonna get your dividend <laughs> you know it, it may go up it may go down it's it, it it's at least somewhat tied to the general equities market um so it's not as pure real estate as buying a property so I don't own any REITs because if I was going to put money in and have exposure to real estate, I'd rather take advantage of the depreciation side of it or rather take advantage of the potential upside of it than just basically have a, a high dividend stock. Got it. We got a question from one of our participants, Nadine Nicole Potter asks, when folks have full-time careers and no experience, how do they find a reliable property management company that will preserve and enhance the value of the property? In my market, Phoenix, finding decent management companies for small and mid-sized properties is almost impossible. Um, I, I don't know Phoenix per se, so I'm not going to say that's wrong, but there are property management companies all over the place. Um, what I would do is... The, Every property management company here is a member of the Chamber of Commerce. Every property manager here goes to real estate meetups uh, without fail. You, there, there are a few big ones everybody knows and everyone gravitates towards. 
but then there's a lot of small ones too. Um, especially if you're looking at small properties, if you're looking at duplexes, triplexes, quads, even up to 10 units, there are property managers out there that do single family homes that can easily handle that. It's not, um, it's not dramatically different. If you start getting a 50, 100 unit, then you need a real property manager uh, that understands the dynamics of that. And there's usually less of those um, in our market. I could probably count them on one hand, at least of the ones I would reach out to. But yeah, every property manager I know is, is a member of our Chamber of Commerce. So if you call them up or go on their website, I'm sure you could pull real estate property managers and they're all happy to meet with you because they're all looking for business. Um, what I've done with a couple in the past is I've just basically sat down and quizzed them essentially. Um, one time I even brought a deal package for a property we were looking at. And I said, here, look at this, look at this P and L. Uh, what do you think of it? And I sent it ahead of time, let them run the numbers. They showed up and I compared it to what I ran just to see, you know, how they thought things through, but you could find them. But again, if you're, if you're talking duplexes and triplexes, a single family property manager will typically handle those as well. If you're looking at bigger ones, it, I, I would argue a good property manager, I don't care what they charge you, is probably the single most important part of, of a successful property. Yeah. Um, I've, seen, I've seen great properties that just had 80% occupancy because they try to self-manage it and just didn't put effort in. I've seen perfectly located properties with rents that were just obscenely low because they didn't put any effort into figuring out the market. Um, I've seen people get taken advantage of in terms of repairs and lawn care. A good property manager will, will clean that up. And I don't care if you have to pay an extra one to 2% of, of revenue for that property manager, you'll save it like five times over. Yeah. I have a suggestion for you and Adina on um, another sort of indirect way to find a good property manager. I have a close friend up here who is uh, has an insurance brokerage. And one of the things they do is insure lots of multifamily properties. Uh, so you could talk to somebody in one of the, you know, ancillary uh, professions that deals with multifamily and see if they have recommendations because they're going to know, uh, uh, from their experience, who, who the good managers are, I think. So uh, that might be. Oh yeah, no, that's, that's great. Also any broker, any commercial yeah. broker will know exactly who the property managers are. Uh, either they sold a property where that manager was on site or they put somebody in a property and, and help put a new manager in. They'll happily tell you because what they want is that property manager down the road when they catch wind that their owner is thinking about selling, they want that property manager to call them as the broker to be the first one yeah. sitting across from that person. Yeah. So there's a very synergetic relationship between commercial brokers and property managers. Yeah. So George, believe it or not, uh, we've, it's actually a little after four o'clock and I don't wanna hold you up any longer. Uh, but we do have one more question if you've got time for it. Uh, it says, what is your prediction of the likelihood of the proposed Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act of passing in this federal legislative session? I don't even know what that is, so I don't yeah. have an answer. Okay. Well, I, I do I do know there's a lot of, there's, there's a number of things that are being discussed right now up there, so I'll talk just more generally. Um, yeah. I, I definitely don't want to get political on this whatsoever. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm going to keep getting this. I'm going to keep that one close to the vest. Anything, it's probably uh, uh, a long shot. But uh, yeah. So anyway, but, but I, I, but but I, but I will, I will just say that there is a lot of push. There is a lot of talk uh, about ways to expand the home program, uh, ways to better utilize the affordable housing tax credits relative to Section 42, if, if this is what this is referring to. Um, that's been a very successful program, but it's so underfunded now. Uh, back when I was doing long amounts and tax credits, maybe 50 to 70 percent of people who applied for them got them. Now people are making just like over the top promises relative to 30 years of, of keeping it affordable and, and all these other things just to win these credits. And maybe like 20 percent of people are winning them. So there's a lot more demand for it than uh, the ability to use it. 
And so th th there is a lot of talk about ways of expanding a lot of these programs, but at the end of the day, it it's a matter of coming up with the funding for it. Uh, same thing with with uh, with Section 8 and vouchers. You could probably increase that funding 100 times and you still wouldn't meet all the demand for it. Uh, so there is a lot of talk up there. Uh, some people of authority are, are kind of pushing in the, the wrong direction relative to affordable housing. Uh, but again, I'm not going to get into the political side of that. Well, thank you, George. Uh, I really appreciate your sharing your time and expertise with us today. Uh, if people want to get in touch with George, his contact information is here. Uh, he is, uh, you'll be able to get all his social media contact info on his website, pursuitcre.com. George is a active and uh, enjoyable uh, guy to connect with on social media. I can tell you that from personal experience. George and I have actually never uh, met in person. And I, oh, I don't think we've ever spoken outside of a webinar. <laughs> I think you're right. Until and, this afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, obviously, so social media, you know, it does work for, for building relationships and, uh, and to building credibility because, you know, based on my interaction with George uh, on the web, I felt highly confident that he was going to be. Uh, the man to, to bring this home for us today. And uh, you did not disappoint. So thank you so much uh, to you. I want to thank uh, Andres and Julia from my team for helping put this together today. And uh, thank you to all the folks that uh, participated and uh, watched and asked questions. Uh, it really was, uh, uh, I can't believe that an hour, more than an hour has passed. All right.